If you want this podcast free of ads, follow us now on patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. Now you're doing there. It's uh, podcast time. John and I are just giggling at. Uh, I was looking to f- go to a detox in Spain, <laughs> in the Rioja region. Shan found it up on my computer. You know, like fourteen day detox course. It's like wine porn, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of wine porn. <laughs> But it's I know new, what it is. It's the new thing, man. It's, it's the new thing. It well, I'm just back from my trip to Beirut, to London, then to Beirut, then to Berlin and back home. And it has been fantastic, but I am now pickled, right? So I'm officially <laughs> I'm officially going to be just drinking mineral water and, you know, hot, you know, hot water with lemon in it and all that sort of carry on. But fantastic time, John. Go to Lebanon. It's, it's to the Lebanon. Lebanon is one of those places that I really want to see. I, I, it's on the on the list, along with Norway, of course. Well, but I've Norway, done the Norway thing. Well, so. you see, the Nor- <laughs> it's a different proposition to Norway, this one. It's a different- but I tell you, I was in Baalbek, mm. the biggest, best preserved Roman ruins in the world, right? Really? Right up beside the Syrian border. The Temple of Jupiter, enormous thing, right? The Temple of Bacchus, now that we're talking about wine, enormous thing as well. Incredibly well preserved. Just outstandingly beautiful. I was in Byblos the other day, one of the old, oldest cities in the world where the Byblos Library. Ah, right. And from library, Bible, or from books. So they made papyrus, right. the, the, the original paper. Yeah. This is where the writing, it's the home of the Phoenicians who engineered the alphabet, the A, B, C, D. That alphabet is Phoenician. Right. right yeah. So I was I was in my element. I was up in Patroon, which is the homes of the Crusaders. I was with my mate uh, Nicholas Nassim Talib. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was actually I spent most of the time uh, talking to Maronite Christians. They were hanging out with them, who actually speak this bizarre half French, half Arabic language. But it's really? not Arabic. It's Aramaic. Lots of it's Amar- Aramaic, yeah. which is the language of Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah. you're in the middle of the most historic place you could ever be, mm. and then Beirut itself is. Phenomenal! You just have to go. It's a but, mad, but, big, but is it crazy not, city. Like okay, so the the image I have of of Beirut now is particularly after the port blast. Oh yes, is that the place is literally falling apart? The second, it's like a bomb site. The second biggest non nuclear explosion ever detonated yeah. in the world was that port bombing. And again, the backstory to that is fascinating. Yes, who yes. was it? Where was the fertilizer meant to be originated for? It was from Georgia. Why was it in the port there? Was it being siphoned off to Syria to bomb Homs and, and yeah. Aleppo? Really, and the corruption involved. And then the and corruption involved. And then, of course, you're living through hyperinflation. So imagine the pound, the Lebanese pound was worth, uh, sorry, one dollar was worth 1,500 Lebanese pounds this time last year. Right. One dollar last night or when I left was worth 22,000. Jeez. So the currency is completely wow. collapsed. So you're in hyperinflation, completely in hyperinflation. Wow. And let's start and what, what, what did that look like then? What it looks like is you actually have kind of wheelbarrows of money going to the bar, right? right and yeah. what it looks like though is Back again, to the Weimar Republic. It is. You're, yeah. you're, you know, it's Germans with wheelbarrows, but it's it's not quite that bad yet. But what it does do in an already fragmented society, and we'll talk about that in a little while, okay? Yeah. All the ethnic differences in the Middle East, what's going on there. There's now another divide. And that's even more real right now. It's those with dollars and those without dollars. So right. what you have is because the dollar's value has gone through the roof, right? And because the local currency has been flooded into the country by the central bank to, again, keep the banks afloat. It's mm-hmm. another way of keeping the banks afloat. Yeah. And because people's current savings in hard currency have completely collapsed, right? The distinction now is those with family outside of Lebanon. It's got a huge diaspora. Yeah. Did you know that 8 million Lebanese Brazilians exist? Just really? Brazilians, just in Brazil alone. Wow. Right? And they're sending money home. And that's keeping some families afloat. Brazil's not in a great shape though either. But yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> but again, the Lebanese are probably the richest diaspora in the world. Right. 
Okay. Incredibly well off Lebanese people all around the world, particularly in Latin America and North America. But equally, they're sending money home. That's keeping some families in dollars. But if you don't have any relations outside, you've no way of getting dollars, mm. you're actually, you've seen a 97% collapse in your take-home income. Jesus. And you put on top of that 1.8 million Syrian refugees in yeah. a country of only five, five and a half million people in yeah. the first place. Then you have the shock of the Syrian war. So you have no tourism because everybody who was going there yeah. is not going to tourism. Because it was the, the, the Paris of the Mediterranean. Yeah, and people were going it. and then, you know, the Lebanese will tell you how you can ski in the in the winter and then you can drive down from the ski slopes and hang out on the beach. Yeah. Because it's still, you know, all that. I mean, it's, it's an amazing country. But like lots of countries, it bet the house, and I think we'll talk about this in a minute, the economic model of Lebanon, like Ireland, it tried to do a tel Celtic Tiger thing. It tried to bet the house on finance, real estate, and banking. And, and what went wrong then? Well, what goes wrong with all those sort of gambles is that when you put all your eggs in one basket, right, you got to make sure that you're just really lucky, right? Mm. So if, for example, you have a system where you absorb in cash by offering higher interest rates, so lots of what we call in economics hot money comes in. Yeah. That hot money, therefore, is in the banking system. The banks then lend that out. They convert it into Lebanese pounds. They yeah, lend that yeah. out, usually to real estate. And of course, there'll be real estate in Lebanon because they had to rebuild the country. So it's an entirely legitimate thing to do. But your entire Ponzi scheme, because it is a Ponzi scheme, because you're mm -hmm. attracting in other people's money, yeah. is predicated on everything going right. And everything went right for Lebanon up until about 2012. And then everything started going wrong. The Arab Spring started. And the war in Syria in particular yeah. started. And the whole thing unraveled, culminating, as you said, with the bomb, but also with COVID. You close down your economy, you have no tourism, yeah, even course. intrepid weirdos like me who are happy to so, go. So so the, am I right in thinking then that the, the main difference between what the Lebanese are doing and what the Irish did was that the Irish, we had the euro. So we were propped up to a certain extent by Europe, whereas they, they had were their own currency. Their own. That's exactly, and let's hold that thought. And let's come back to the economics in a second, because I want to talk about monetary economics, how you can go from stability to hyperinflation without really realizing what's happening. Well, so how does that happen then? How does it creep up? Well, in this, is, this is my thing, monetary economics. Yeah. And do you remember when we talked about inflation a couple of weeks ago? And I was telling you that for a small open economy, the most important price is the exchange rate. Mm. because you either import, you import so much of your stuff. If your exchange rate is stable, it means the price of your imports stable. So you don't import inflation. If your exchange rate collapses, it means the price of your imports go through the roof and you import inflation. So for central banks all around the world, the smaller you are, the more dexterous you have to be. And I remember learning this working in, in our place, but also studying all small open economies of which, you know, Ireland was one, Israel is one, Lebanon is one, Finland, Denmark, all yeah. these small countries that have to play a kind of canny game because the money supply in every country is divided into two things, John. One is called DCE, which is domestic credit expansion, which is your own local money. Okay. And the other bit is foreign reserves. It's the amount of foreign currency yeah. you have yeah. in the reserves, okay. right? And keeping your exchange rate is a balancing act between these two. Now, what tends typically to happen for small open economies that don't have huge resources, right, is you tend to run trade deficits because you want Apple computers and you want Audis and you want the standard of living sure. of other countries, right? Mm. Now, if you can't generate your own income, enough of that to buy all these good stuff, what you'll then do is you'll run a trade deficit. So money, foreign exchange, will be leaving your country every single year, every single day, right? Yeah. So how do you actually get money back in so that your trade and your current account balance, right? That's the yeah. key. Yeah, okay. And what you do then is you depend on financial jiggery-pokery. So what you do is you <laughs> issue bonds and debts in your own currency, IOUs, yeah. and you exchange them for dollars, right? So that's what happens. That's how, that's what all, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing is how small countries finance themselves with their own currencies is very typically you run a trade deficit. Right. Once you run a trade deficit, at the end of the year, you have to square that 
balance sheet. So you have to find foreign currency to come in or else your currency will fall. If your currency falls, you will import inflation and the whole thing unravels. Right, right? okay. So it's a, it's, it is, it is a, it's a very difficult trick to pull off. Now, we tried to do it throughout the 70s. We, we decided to go our own way against sterling. We were tied to sterling from 1922 to 1979, so we had no mm. monetary autonomy. Then we decided we'd have our own currency, the punt. Remember that one? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the punt we, we claimed was a hard currency. We actually devalued it five times in eight years, <laughs> right. right? So it was always sliding all over the place, right? Because of this dilemma, right? Yeah. So then what you do is the country says, okay, well, the way in which we will balance our trade deficits is we will run fiscal surpluses, right? The government will not spend, right? So we'll have austerity or kind of permanent austerity. So you, you have to cut that, cut backs in health and education so, yeah. and blah, so this blah, blah. This is when spoofers like Gareth Fitzgerald, who were on the on the telly, I mean, at least how he admitted he was a spoofer. <laughs> like he, at least how he said, look, really I've, got, against I've got, well, at least how he said, I've got the Charvet shirt and you peasants can go yeah. and eat cake because I'm going <laughs> off, I've got my own island. Like he did it in a sort of like, I'm telling you what I am, Right. Fitzgerald was worse because he pretended he was something else, right? Anyway, so what happens is then, if you're playing this balancing act, right, your budget deficit is a very important figure. And the reason it's a very important figure is because your budget deficit, if it gets too big, it will scare foreign investors because you have to pay back too much money. They will take money out of the country. Okay. Your exchange okay. rate yeah. will will collapse, then you'll jack interest rates up to attract in more money, to attract in fresh money, to actually take the place of the money that's left. And as you jack up interest rates, your domestic economy contracts, right? right. And that's what gotcha. Gareth Fitzgerald did here. Right. One, uh, here. I mean, is there any country that runs a surplus? There are countries that are usually resource rich. So if you're a small country, right, usually your friends, the Norwegians, for example, right? Yeah. They run a surplus because they export oil. They've got some resource that everybody wants. But America has massive deficits. But that's what I say, small countries. Then when you get to big countries, it's quite, quite different, right? Right, okay. So the, the Americans don't have to worry about their exchange rate. Why? Because the vast majority of their inflation is created internally, okay. which is what they're worried about right now. But it's actually, like, it's a blip. Yeah, right? yeah, It's, yeah, it's yeah, nothing yeah. like, when you've just been in a country with 90% inflation, you know that's a problem. Right? <laughs> so that's the how the small open economy model works. Lebanon, and what, what happened in Ireland is we realized maybe through the 80s and the 90s, that this is a very hard game to play. We were devaluing all the time. We had current account crises. We had budget crises. We'd, you know, maybe just give away the exchange rate. Mm. Now, I actually think that was probably a bad move myself, but that's, you know, I think we could have continued playing that and we could have adjusted from the banking crisis better yeah. had we had our own currency. But what Lebanon teaches you is when you have your own currency, everything kind of depends on your internal management and your ability to manage the situation. So what the Lebanese did is, the Lebanese have this civil war. So the whole country is destroyed, right? Mm. A guy called Hariri comes in as the president yeah. in 1993. And he says, look, what we've got to do is we've got to rebuild this country. We have no money. We have no infrastructure. We have 100,000 of our people dead. We have the Israelis occupying on one side, the Syrians occupying on another side. We're screwed. Mm. And all we can do is try and get the economy going. And if we get the economy going with a fair wind, with a bit of luck, maybe, just maybe, we rebuild the country and we'll heal some of those wounds. And at least Lebanese people will feel that they live in a country that's going in the right place. Yeah. But he said, we have a problem. We don't have any money. Right. right? Which is always a big problem. We have exports from tourism and agriculture, and that's kind of it. Right. But Lebanese... Hash. Lots of hash. They have loads of hash. I'm yeah. down the Becca Valley. You would have loved the scent. <laughs> You would have loved the Becca Valley last Thursday morning. It was a wake and bake situation like no other, right? I'll tell you all about that in a second, right? So, oh, fair. Uh, but you would have, you would have, you would have, you would have liked it. Um, where was I? <laughs> back on track. Back on track. Back on track. Just so, eat more crisps. Uh, yeah, fine. yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just here, sitting here eating a massive big kebab. Um, so Hariri comes in, he says, okay, we've no money. What are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to offer higher interest rates than average on deposits. We're going to ensure that the currency stays stable. We're going to take big loans from the Saudis and from the Gulf Arabs in order to anchor the currency, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to do this. And so it, it is like a Ponzi scheme. What you're doing is what you're doing is you're, you're basically importing short-term money 
and you're lending it long term. I'll explain that in a second. So basically what they did is this worked for a while. So the banking system was then start, does a bit of an Anglo, right? Yeah, yeah. The banks get huge and huge and huge. All these dollars are coming in. They're offering people more interest rate than they would get in dollars in America. So people are happy as long as the exchange rate's quite stable, everyone wins. But what ultimately happens is your money supply becomes entirely polluted with really short-term money. Yeah. And what difference that makes is the banks then, therefore, carry two slightly existential risk for banks. One is an exchange rate risk. So what has happened is you, John Davis, are coming to me, the Bank of Lebanon, and yeah. you're saying, I'm going to deposit $500 million with you. You owe me $500 million. The Bank of Lebanon says, that's cool. That's fine. Now, that means the Bank of Lebanon, if you want to call in your loan, has to find $500 million, not Lebanese pounds. Okay, right, so yeah. there needs to be loads of dollars in the country for them. So the banks then are carrying a risk that Irish banks didn't do. They are carrying a exchange rate risk, right? We never really carried an exchange rate risk because we borrowed most of our stuff from Germans and French. Uh, you, and and euros, euros, yeah, euros. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the first thing. Second thing then is you're also borrowing, your, you're giving me $500 million, but I'm giving you an IOU for two years. So every two years, we've got to roll that debt mm. over. But... I'm lending that $500 million in Lebanese pounds in the mortgage market. Yeah. So I have an asset that's 30 years, yeah. but I've had a liability that may be two years or 18 months. So you have what's called a time risk. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you call in, not only your dollars, you squeeze me, but if you call in, you squeeze my, what's called the yield curve. Yeah. So there's two massive risks being borne by the Lebanese Why bank. Why did they do that? Was it Because... This is what banks do. Banks are... No, but but that, that particular strategy was clearly so risky. Well, you'd be amazed how many countries do it. All the Asian tigers, right? You know, remember that big Asian tiger collapse yeah. in 1980, yeah. 18, 19, sorry, 19, 1997, 1998? That was all the same play. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, right. all at the same game. Borrowing short, lending long, and borrowing in foreign dollars and lending in your own, yeah. right? So it's a highly risky strategy, but you'd be amazed because it's very hard for other countries. How, how else are you going to do it? No, no, I, I understand. But I, I also thought that a lot of the Arab states were their backers. Now, this is what's happened. So the Arab states were their backers. So that yeah. was their kind of insurance policy. Yeah. Like, you know, these are soft loans from friends, yeah. right? And you'll see all about the Corniche in Beirut. It's all huge posh apartments, largely empty now, owned by Arab investors. Yeah. Arab sheiks, playboys, princelings, all that's going to yeah. carry on, right? But that strategy is fragile. And the amazing thing about fragility is the more robust it looks, the more fragile it is. That's the only lesson I've found mm -hmm. out in economics. Explain that one. Well, like, the more... It's like Ireland, you remember, during the, the more the boom times and people are getting new cars, and new, the more it looks good the more fragile it is usually, yeah. right? Because you're usually buying and selling bits of your own country to each other at inflation at inflated prices and pretending it's growth. Yeah. And you're borrowing somebody else's money to do so. So your standard of living is rented, not earned. And that's the difference, right? right? Gotcha. So you're renting yeah. it, right? So this is the Lebanese were up to this carry on and they had to do this all the time. And then they get hit by the war in Syria. Yeah. Suddenly they have ISIS next door to them. Okay, think about it. Like they had ISIS swarming all over northern Syria, right? They have 1.8 refugees come in. They humanitarianly take them in, but they've no money. They can't do anything. They've no, yeah, they've no yeah, money. Yeah, right? yeah. Their tourism industry collapse. Of course. Their agricultural industry, there's no exports, mm. right? Now, take all this will be bad enough for any country. Then they have that huge bomb that blows up half of Beirut. Then they get COVID on top yeah. of everything, and they've no money to pay. Because the way in which we dealt with COVID, we just borrowed in the international markets. In the last 18 months, so yeah, don't yeah. worry, we'll pay it back. Nobody will lend to the Lebanese now. And your point about being in the euro is right. When we collapsed, we had a choice. We had to go somewhere else to find the money to plug the banking system, right? Because had you allowed the banking system to go, everybody's savings would have gone. Yeah. In the same way as what happened in the hyperinflation in Lebanon, yeah. right? But we were allowed or given permission to do this because we were in the euro. So basically, there was just a yield curve play within the euro. The gamble was, will the Irish default or not? If they don't default, the money will come in. Now, I happen to think we could have done a lot more flexible things to get out quicker. But be that as hey, it may. Oh, we're, we're here yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was the choices that we made, right? Yeah. 
Iceland was outside the euro and made a few choices, defaulted much more, allowed their currency drop and came out quicker. But Iceland has fish as neighbours. It lives in a quite isolated neighbourhood, okay? (laughs) Fish don't piss you off, okay? (laughs) Think about what Lebanon has. It has Syria and Israel as neighbours. Yeah. And it's in a power struggle. So the society or the credibility of the country collapsed. Now, everyone says, well, isn't it all about the central bank printing money? Yes and no. Because if they don't print money, how are they going to pay? They have no money. So how are they going to pay the soldiers? How are they going to pay the police force? How are they going to pay the nurses, teachers, salaries? They have to print money to do so. Yeah. And now that that Ponzi scheme is over, that we are a dollarized currency and country, the currency has collapsed. The place will probably rectify itself quicker than you think because it's kind of hit rock bottom. But that means for people on a daily basis is that if you're young, if you're educated, you just want to leave the country. But one of the things about Lebanon is the fact that it is in itself a melting pot of people, of religions, of sex, of all sorts of stuff going on. So they're not exactly pulling together. No, (laughs) there ain't no pulling together. So on that point, see what you did there? On that point, let us go to Lebanon. Let's talk to Zaina Qadr, who is the Al Jazeera correspondent in Lebanon, and let's spice the dish of monetary and fiscal delinquency and unfortunate events with the ethnic diversity, and then see how we go. Now, last week, in a cafe called the Salon Beirut, which is a fantastic jazz bar in Beirut, I met with a friend of the late Robert Fisk, Zina Qadr, who is the Al Jazeera correspondent in Lebanon. And we had a fantastic conversation, so much so that I thought if I could share this conversation with all of you, I think we all have a better grasp of what's going on in the Middle East. We're 20 years after 9-11. We've had the invasion of Iraq. We've had the invasion of Afghanistan. We've had the collapse of Syria. We have a war in Yemen. We have proxy battles going on all over the place. And when you're in Lebanon, when you're in Beirut, you feel these proxy wars, but you need them explained to you. And Zaina sat me down and she gave me a chapter and verse tutorial in all things Middle Eastern politics. Zaina, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. I'm in great. I'm glad that you enjoyed your stay in Beirut. It was it was fantastic. I had a, had a wonderful time. But let's zero in on the Middle East and the conflict as it is today, not as it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but where it is today, and why understanding Lebanon and all the various different tribes and sects and ethnicities is kind of crucial to understanding the very different layers of what's going on in the Middle East. Yes, I mean, we always used to talk about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. No doubt that conflict is still there. But over, you know, in recent years, there's a new conflict. I wouldn't say it emerged. I'm sure it was it was always there. But it came to the forefront, and that is the struggle, uh, the regional struggle, the struggle for supremacy between uh, two major powers, Iran, Saudi Arabia, who happened to represent the Sunni and the Shia, and especially since uh, the death of Saddam Hussein, um, that was really a turning point in, in, in this struggle because many Sunnis will feel that was the beginning of, of let's say, the, the Shia takeover of, of the region. So you, you have this conflict. You need to understand this conflict to understand uh, what is happening in, in the Middle East today. Where does Lebanon fit in this? Well, the Iranian-Saudi rivalry plays out in many countries across the region. Lebanon is only one battleground. You mentioned the war in Yemen. It's played out there. You mentioned Syria. You mentioned Iraq. I mean, all these countries is where this, this struggle is being played out. 
Uh, now, Lebanon makes it easier to understand because it is a more open society, because there's more freedom of the press, even though, of course, as of late, the authorities have been clamping down on freedom of speech as much as they can. But nevertheless, uh, this still remains a, a quote unquote, a, a free country where, you know, the different different players and their local allies, you know, make their make their positions very, very clear. The power struggle, you have Iran not allied to, but closely affiliated with Russia in the area, maybe a little bit closer to China in the area, and the United States very much the backers of Saudi. Is that the way it plays out as well? It used to. I mean, and nowadays the Biden administration and the Saudi prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, they don't seem to be getting along like in the past. Saudi Arabia is no longer the main ally, if you like, in the region. A lot has changed. Uh, it is a very cool relationship. In fact, some people will tell you um, that the decision by Saudi Arabia to cut diplomatic ties in Lebanon has as much to do with how they see uh, the Iranian dominance over the country, as well as a message to the Americans that they don't like the way the Americans have been dealing with the conflict. So it's no longer that that old divide that that everybody you know used to talk about. So you have Iran, you know, with Russia and China in one camp, and Saudi Arabia and America on, on the other. Look at look at Syria, where the two main uh, allies of the Syrian regime are the Russians and the Iranians, even though. Both these countries are vying for influence in Syria. In fact, many Arab countries are hoping that Russia will be able to push Iran out of Syria as their way back into into Syria. So in Syria, the Russians and the Iranians, they may have common interests and it works in their benefit to, to be on the same side, but there is a struggle for power. I mean, both sides, I'll just give you one example. Both sides support one division in the Syrian army. No way. I did not know that. I did not know that. Yes, you have the fourth division. Yeah. You have the fourth division in the Syrian army, which is backed by the Iranians. And you have the fifth corps, which was basically created by the Russians. And, you know, their differences are played out uh, in southern Syria, for example. Some even will tell you the some of the assassinations and bombings and the instability which was witnessed in the southern province of Dharan, Syria, is a result of this um, struggle between these two units of, of the Syrian army. Wow. So even within the Syrian army, the manifestation is there. Iran on one side, Russia on the other. Can, I, can you explain to me the Iranian position with respect to Hezbollah and the strength of Hezbollah in Lebanon and what that means for the region in general? Well, Hezbollah for the Iranians is their success story, if you like. It gives them powerful position in the Middle East. Hezbollah, being based in Lebanon, is uh, uh, along the border with Israel, its arch enemy, Israel. And Hezbollah, over the years, has become a major player in politics. It's it's no longer just an armed group that was fighting uh, the Israelis uh, when the Israelis were occupying territory in southern Lebanon. It is now a major player in Lebanese politics. It has representation in parliament, representation in government. And along with its allies, they control political power. And they have a lot of say uh, within security organizations. Uh, they control borders. They control the Syria, the border with Syria. I mean, they have come a long way uh, since the days, let's say, back in 1982 when they were first created. And then uh, when they started to fight um, the Israeli occupation in southern Lebanon. And now it is a regional force and their fighters, their commanders have taken part in, in the war in Syria. And they have people in Yemen. They have people in Iraq. So basically, Hezbollah is Iran's success story and gives it leverage in politics, in in the power struggle playing out across the region. And tell me, what is going on in Yemen and how does that relate to everything as well that we're discussing? Well, Yemen, it's the same story. You have the Saudis and and you have the Iranians. The Iranians back the Houthis. And as of late, the Houthis have been uh, taking ground in Mareb, which is is a strategic city, a strategic area, oil-rich, 
if that is lost and the Houthis gain gain ground there, then and then basically uh, the Saudis were defeated in Yemen. And Yemen is bordering Saudi Arabia. For, yeah. for Saudi Arabia, this is a national security threat. The Houthis have managed to fire rockets into Saudi, Saudi territory. So you can see this power struggle playing out in different battlefields across the region. It's a dangerous divide because... For example, I can tell you in, in, in Lebanon, it's no longer just political. It, it takes on a sectarian nature and you, you feel this even when talking to people. Sunnis, for example, in Lebanon feel that they have been weakened, they have been marginalized at the expense of the Shia. So how do they see that? They see that as an Iranian, quote, takeover of Lebanon. So... It, it, it is serious, and I'm sure you know that when a divide is no longer just political, when it turns sectarian as well. Oh yeah, no, no, we know all about that, and I was, I was, I was amazed by the kind of bizarre similarities between driving from Beirut to Baalbek and actually driving from west to east Belfast. So every area in Belfast is now more or less bedecked by the flags of one side or the other. So basically it's like it's like it's like it's like a, it's like a giant sectarian pissing competition, you know? That basically this is our area, this is and I was thinking when I was driving from from Beirut I went through the Christian areas, then into the Druze areas, then into Sunni, then into Catholic, then into Shia, then into Palestinian, then back into Sunni, then back into Shia and every single time there was a different flag, but you were made very aware that you are a different poster, but you were actually this is a patchwork uh, and you're in this area or that area. And it seemed to me that, you know, not so much that ethnic, ethnic tensions were heightened, but they were just ever present. Yes. I mean, um, the war ended in 1990, but did it really end? Uh, was there real reconciliation? Uh, no. Let's look at it this way. I'll make it simple. Pre-1975, before the war broke out, you had the Maronites who were powerful, really, in, in government. The war ended. They lost They lost power. They lost influence. And uh, the Sunnis, the, the post of prime minister, which is reserved for Sunnis, according to Lebanon's sectarian power sharing agreement, they gained more, more power at the end of, of the war. And the Shias felt left out. Today, through uh, as a result of Hezbollah's growing strength, uh, you now have the Shias who don't necessarily hold power according to the constitution, but, you know, in, in reality, they do. And so the Sunnis feel that they have been left out. And so you have this deep divide uh, dating back to, to, to the days of the Civil War. The Civil War really never, never really ended. I mean, Two years ago, people will probably remember seeing those mass demonstrations in Beirut and everyone was yes. talking about a revolution and people want change. And everyone was seeing, the, you know, they were carrying the Lebanese flag for the first time. People were carrying the Lebanese flag. You're not seeing flags of, of, of political parties, of the sect, mainly sectarian political parties. But in reality, that flag, it has very a little meaning really in this country you know there, there there is no nation state as we understand it you said something very interesting last week you said you know they always default to the israelis are the problem but you were saying to me that the israelis were kind of slightly secondary to this this very very new ethnic sectarian division between the saudis and the the iranians it, it, is, it is a very serious divide. It is a struggle for power between two regional heavyweights. And you see, sometimes, let me tell you the narrative that, that is now being used. I mean, even it's on social media, leaders even use it, officials use it, especially when they're speaking to their own uh, constituencies. For example, they, they give the people a choice. Either you belong to the so-called resistance camp uh, or you, you belong to the pro Israeli camp because, for example, Hezbollah is accusing some Arab states of normalizing ties with Israel. So if you support Saudi Arabia or support any local ally of Saudi Arabia, then you automatically 
are a supporter of the Israelis. Now, most Lebanese will tell you, no, it's not necessarily if we don't agree with Hezbollah's politics, we are not pro-Israeli. You, know, you, you cannot make that equation. It is a false equation. And it is the way of keeping people to, to support one party over, over the other. So it, it is serious. It is the, this, this Arab-Iranian divide. I mean, today, Lebanon, Gulf Arab states, a number of Gulf Arab states have severed ties with this country. And Gulf Arab states are the traditional economic and political partners of Lebanon. And in fact, Saudi Arabia went as far as to ban all import from Lebanon, which is going to hurt an already struggling economy. So if Lebanon is going to be isolated from the Gulf region, and of course, Gulf countries, there's no official estimate, but it's believed 350,000 Lebanese work in Gulf Arab countries, and they, they are sending money back home. And there's already an unprecedented economic crisis here. So these Gulf Arab states went as far as severing ties with with a country they believe they can no longer engage with because it is now controlled by the Iranians. Now, this is, I mean, th- this is a yet one more shock that Lebanon cannot withstand. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, in a second just about the economy before we go. But can I can I ask you about therefore who's on whose side? Okay, to make it quite simple, now when we look at the Sunni Shia divide. When we look at the Israeli-Palestinian divide, when we ask ourselves what's going on with Turkey, because it's a huge power that seems to be looking for a role, hasn't really got a role, and what we're talking about, and the Gulf states themselves, the Gulf states themselves seem to be caught as well, not necessarily knowing which way to jump. Certainly they're not going to jump the Iranian way, but do they get deeper into the pockets of Saudi Arabia? How does this, how does it play out? Who supports who? Well, it's hard. It's look. You you can you can say, for example, the majority of Shias in Lebanon, for example, will support Hezbollah and the other Shia political party, Amal. Then you can say uh, the majority of Sunnis will want, um, you know, consider Saudi Arabia as the their protector, if you like, but. It goes without saying that there are some Sunnis who disagree, and it goes without saying that there are some Shias who disagree. Even among the Druze community, the minority in Lebanon, uh, some of them will support the the pro-Iranian camp and others will support the pro-Saudi camp. It's not black and white, even though... In many ways, you you can you can safely say the majority of Shias in Lebanon see themselves belonging to the pro-Iranian camp, while the majority of Sunnis in Lebanon see themselves as belonging to the pro-Saudi camp. That that's the way it is it is seen here. Now, just because you support the Saudi camp over the Iranian camp does not necessarily mean you support the Israelis or you support normalizing ties with the Israelis, even though the other camp may use this as some sort of a card. Zena, can I ask you just before we go, who supports the Christians? Where do they derive their strength externally from or internally from? Because they seem to me to be the most precarious people in Lebanon now. Well, true. And I'm sure you've spoken to many of them and they'll tell you the reason why we are weak today is because we are not united because of the internal divisions among the Christian leaders, historical animosities between them. You have some of them who are in the pro-Iran camp, are allies of Hezbollah. And even though they don't, for example, share the same agenda for Lebanon, but maybe they consider this alliance as a way to ensure that they will gain the presidency. Um, And then you have other Christians who do not support Hezbollah, who believe Hezbollah works for Iranian interests, and it doesn't shy away from the fact that it is uh, loyal to, to Iran. So they believe that this stands in the way of Lebanon's sovereignty, and that that Christian leader, for example, is Samir Jaja. And they are considered to be pro-Saudi. And then, of course, you have other Christians who are neither pro-Iranians or pro-Saudis. And so it's because they've been so uh, fragmented, they're so weak, and they need to, if you like, you know, it's not the right word, but hang on to either one side in order to, to exist. Sure. So they make these accommodations and, and these compromises all the time because they don't have a big backer outside, as they may have had many years ago in the guise of France or whatever it had to be, you know, maybe 60 or 70 years ago. Well, yeah, but even France, they, they 
A lot of people lost uh, faith in France when France, when the French president came just a few days after the Beirut b- blast at the port, and he made promises to the Lebanese people, you know. And then later on, he took a step back, and they feel felt that he, you know the Macron made a deal with with the Iranians in order for a government to be formed. So they felt as well let down. Uh, many of uh, many of the Christians thought that you know the West you know would step in and would 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 force a change in the political leadership. But it's easier said than done. I mean, even Macron himself said that, uh, you know, you guys elected these leaders. How do you expect me to get rid of them? We have to wait for the elections right now. We're not going to be funneling any money through the government, but giving it directly to NGOs and to people on the ground. But many really have lost faith. They believe that the West will will make deals, will make economic deals that suit them instead of work for the interests of the Lebanese people. And just before we go, I'd like to ask you one question with something that struck me when I was in Lebanon. I had conversations with Christians, with Druze, with Sunnis, and the antipathy towards the Palestinians was not something I kind of expected. Can you explain that to me? Because it was quite palpable. I didn't expect it at all. They were saying that the, the Palestinians and the Syrians, the Syrians very, very obvious occupiers, disruptors, but there was a sense that the Palestinians too had destabilized Lebanon extraordinarily. Many people, well, it depends who you speak to, because, you know, at at one point, uh, the PLO created a state within a state in Lebanon, and the Palestinians were a part of the war. And they, some people will tell you that, you know, if it wasn't for their presence, uh, you know, so so they actually blame them for playing a role in in the civil war. And uh, they, they created a state within a state. It's the same accusation that is made against Hezbollah today. It really depends who you, who you speak to. Of course, there, were, there will be others who will support the Palestinians and say they have nowhere else to go. Others are worried because they're mainly Sunni. So if they are naturalized in Lebanon, then it affects the demography and the Sunnis, you know, it's all about numbers in Lebanon, isn't it? And then you have the Syrians. Many people will say because of them, the economy crashed. Because of them, we lost jobs. But then others will argue and say, well, you guys would not, no Lebanese will do the job a Syrian is willing to do. And many will say the economy collapsed because of the economic model, because of corruption and mismanagement. And don't blame uh, the refugees for this. So, yes, it's Palestinians. They blame them for playing a role in, 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 in the war, for launching attacks from Lebanese soil onto Israel, for triggering the Israeli invasion. And of course, but, but then you have other people who will, in on, on terms of the Syrians, for example, they'll say that, uh, you know, we have to support them. They ran away from a brutal dictator. And it's mainly Sunnis who will tell you that because those who ran away were mainly Syrian Sunnis. I'm looking at John over here. Are you any the wiser, John? Are you any the wiser? (laughs) Before we let Zina go. (laughs) So incredibly complicated. Isn't it? Well, you know, the Dave McWilliams podcast deals with complicated issues. You know what I tried to do the whole time? Not use the word complicated because I don't like that word because it's not. It's, it's, I always say this, it's a power struggle, whether it's in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, it is a fight for power. It's played out by a different actors in each country, the names change. And it's easier uh, to, to do this when, when a society is polarized, when it's divided, when you have these sectarian divisions, because you play on this. And uh, sometimes you do it by proxy, sometimes you do it directly. Bottom line, power struggle. Sina, we will leave it there. Thank you so much for chatting to us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. I'm definitely going to go back. I'll bring John with me. Oh yeah, definitely. Sina, <laughs> thanks so much You're for talking to welcome. us. You're most welcome. It feels to me like a giant big chessboard. Yeah. That's, so, that's, that's changing at a rapid rate. It really does. And very cynical players are playing the chess board. Yeah. And the Lebanon is the board. So they're moving the pawns and the queens and the kings and the bishops. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's it's an ethnic mess. And you said earlier on, you know, in a crisis, you've got to pull together. And, and they're pulling in different yeah. directions. And they're being pulled in different directions. Yeah. You know the way they say, you know, if you forget your history, it's, it repeats itself. This is actually probably one area that they probably should forget the history. Yeah, and draw a line of the ground. <laughs> you can't. I mean, you're in these towns, you're in Byblos, and you're looking at a crusader citadel, right? Because these people are 
some of them are Aramaic Christians from yeah. Jesus' time, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? The real but McCoy. Others, the real McCoy, <laughs> yeah. But others are Christians who came with the Crusaders. And that's going back a long time. Yeah. But I, I had this moment, I was in what, the Citadel in Byblos the other, other day, and they've got these little slits for, for oh, arrows, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you felt that sort of idea of you're kind of the invader here. And how many invaders have kind of looked out at Lebanon? Waves upon waves. So it starts with the, you know, you have the Persians, you have the Babylonians, the Persians, the Malmuks, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Crusaders, yeah, the yeah, Ottomans, yeah, yeah. the French, the Brits. I mean, everybody's been there and everyone's left a legacy. And in some countries, the legacy of ethnic diversity can be very enriching. But in a country like Lebanon, where, as Zaina said, the big players are playing out a game. It's really tragic. I mean, it's, the, it's that it's that title of the Robert Fisk book, Pity the Nation. Like, as Zaina was saying, like, it is the, the proxy war. Is there a risk, though, of that proxy war turning real? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Syria, who would have, who would have said that a country like Syria would actually implode in a matter of weeks? Yeah. There is. <laughs> there is. But the horrible thing about Lebanon, I would say, is the players have more interest in it being weak and divided and being signifying other victories than actually going and taking over and imposing some sort of order on the place. But can I just say before we go, John, the best thing you can do for Lebanese people is go there and spend a few quid. Really, visit the place because it's completely safe. I mean, I, the, the crazy thing is like, yeah, yeah, we've yeah. just got on as if it's a war. It's not a war zone. It's completely safe. You can walk around. I was there with Shan and Lucy and other friends of ours. They were walking around as Western women, completely safe, late, late at night. I mean, there's a little few blackouts that make it a bit weird, right? Because the electricity yeah. comes on and off. But the place is exceptional. That's, that squid look good. Oh, yes, the squid <laughs> with Nassim look good. But I'd say, you know, if you're concerned about Lebanese people, the best thing you can do is go and visit them. Give them dollars. Spend some money over there. You should do a podcast from there. Oh, man. You, the Becca Valley. Stadia. We we'll talk to you next week. Just before you go, thank you all very much for supporting us on Patreon. And also, if you don't support us on Patreon and you want to learn economics, we have this fantastic new course, which has a video element. It has an audio element. It has all the reading lists. It has notes. It has all sorts of bizarre and unusual takes from the world of economics. It's called International Trade and Money. First three lectures are Humanomics, which is about putting humanity back into economics. Second lecture is the trading ape, the idea that we are actually hardwired to trade. And the third is the myth of barter. And of course, this is a 14 lecture series taking us all the way up to crypto. If you want to learn economics, join me on Patreon patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. <laughs>